Sholem Aleichem, Assalamu Aleichem, Shalom Aleichem. It is important to understand as Bundists, we are not anti-communist. We are non-communist socialists, and we are Jewish. We welcome any solidarity with Trotskyists, anarcho-communists, anarcho-collectivists, and anarcho-syndicalists. We, however, are seeing a growing trend of Marxist-Leninists, Marxist-Leninist Maoists, and Maoist Third Worldists showing the most solidarity towards us. One of the manifestations we are seeing this is our guest here today, and we hope with this conversation we shall be taking this in the direction that this seems to be going. Sometimes there is confusion as to what is anti-Semitism. The first type of anti-Semitism is Judeophobia and Islamophobia. The second type of anti-Semitism is the belief in a Jewish race and or ethnicity which manifests as racism. For example, anti-Semitic racism is manifested against Ashkenazi Jewry as seen to be subhuman, or when Jewry of color are denied that they have Jewishness due to the racist fiction of racial ethnic Jewry. The third type is Jewish communist conspiracy theories and or other conspiracy theories concerning Jewry that harms both uh, Jewish and non-Jewish alike. And then the fourth type is racism manifested against groups that are known on the geopolitical sphere to be predominantly Muslim or have a high Muslim population, often whether they are predominantly Muslim or not, such as hatred towards Middle East, that is the Western Orient, hatred towards Pakistan, which is not even the Middle East Western Orient, hatred towards Bangladesh, hatred towards groups that are known to be having a high population of Muslims. This is another form of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism comes in different dimensions, and it is the hope of every member of the Bundist movement that Dr. Abram Weisfeld will be giving all of this into consideration and the information that he has well studied. We can think of nobody better to bring this forward than Dr. Abram Weisfeld. In the first part of this video, I shall be interviewing Jason the Mouse Rebel on the subject of his book. In the second part of this video, I will ask some questions that we address to Marxist-Leninists, Marxist-Leninist-Maoists, and Maoist Third Worldists. And the third part of this video is casual conversation on the subject of combating liberalism in our time. So Jason Unruh is here with us. He is the founder and anchorman of Maoist Rebel News. Our emissary of solidarity, Domin Newman, has said that 60% of the theory of Maoism third worldism is embraced by today's modern Bundism. That although Bundists and Maoist third worldists do not always arrive at the same conclusions, both identify the same apathetic diagnosis concerning the first world. We wish to welcome our guest. We would like to start this interview by providing him with a decent platform that he may be able to talk to us about his book, Maoism, Third Worldism, the Fourth Stage of Marxist Theory. Welcome, Jason Unruh. Hi. Hi. I'm going to read a piece of Who Are Our Friends and Who Are Our Enemies, which is part of Chapter 2 who is really revolutionary. 
What we see today is something that most Marxists don't want to acknowledge. The working class in the first world is not out for revolution. They do not want to overthrow the system and replace it with a new one. They don't want to use communism as a hammer. Instead of, of having a revolutionary aim of greater equality, they are only seeking more for themselves. When we look at the global distribution of wealth, we already see that the first world has too much. If we were to equitably distribute the world's wealth, which as Marxists we are supposed to, we can see that the first world would drop significantly at a 72 to 1 wealth gap between the two worlds. We can get an idea of how big it is going to be. Even if revolution was achieved in the first world, the value would still have to be distributed back to the third world, where it came from. We're not talking about reparations, we are talking about a reorientation of where the wealth that is generated by the third world is going. As utopian as first worldists see the working class, they are still going to reject the reversal of global value transfer. Any communist can claim they would be in support of it, but would the first world masses who have been promised more go along with it? I sincerely doubt that they would support the Revolutionary Party when they are told that they cannot have two cars in their driveways or a new television every year, or being told that apartment buildings will be constructed instead of detached homes with their own backyards. Closing the wealth gap would make these things a relic of a past global economic order. First, world people would demand that these things be returned and revolt against the Revolutionary Party. People would demand that the old ways be returned. They would demand that their privilege be returned to them. So, what had you been thinking when you wrote this? Or what had you been thinking about, or had you been thinking about this for some time, you know, when you wrote it? Uh, what, what, what are your true thoughts? Well, I, I can't take credit for the creation of third worldism. That's something that existed, you know, even before I, I, I was a third worldist. But, uh, there was a lot of work the LLCO did in understanding global inequality, and an OECD study showed that uh, inequality between the rich countries and the poor countries grew. From about 1850 or 1860, it was about uh, 12 to 1. Now it's 72 to 1. If we were to redistribute that kind of wealth, we would realize that the, the first world would come down significantly. Uh, there is a, a great website that I would recommend called Global Rich List. Essentially, you go in there and you type in what your income is you know, according to you know whatever your after-tax uh, income actually is, and it will tell you literally on the global scale – uh, where are you? Are you in the top 10%? Are you in the top 15%? Something like that. So someone who, say, had made $1,000 a month in Canada, and that's that's like a, that's like a part-time job, one part-time job that's not even really enough to live off of, that's still within the top 15% of wealth earners in the entire world. It actually really is that much of, of a of a desperate difference, and then uh, from that comes the realization that if we were to equalize wealth across the world, we would be bringing down the first world to a very significant degree. And if that's the goal is egalitarianism is to be equal, that's what's going to need to be done. Now, if we've learned. Uh, anything from history is that when there's been a significant reduction in the the wealth of one section of a population, it creates a hostility. The problem, I think, that is that first worldists keep telling people in the first world that they're going to get more. You know, we're going to give you, you know. F uh, there was a statistic once one time I got that if you took the entire world's wealth and you divided it among the world's population, it would be about five thousand dollars a year per person. Now this of course is in dollar terms, not in the actual allocation of resources under a new system. 
but I th- but I think you get my meaning on that. Well, I do, and especially with the the fear, particularly in the United States, of redistribution of wealth. <laughs> you know, that could be this this it, it would be problematic in the minds of most Americans, particularly. I mean, well, rich Americans and middle class and better off working class, which is sadly most Americans, they don't even care about their own poor. Yeah, um, the, the the points and the condemnation made, we largely share, as has been said before. It's a, uh, it's a, it's an, it's an issue, and and it's the 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 point should be to be fair, but unfortunately, you know, countries like Britain, America, Canada, most of Europe, the rest of Europe, they just don't, they just don't seem to, they just don't seem to go for what's necessary, for all the reasons that have been mentioned. Next, we are going to read a piece from What is Proletariat, which is part of Chapter 3, Who is the Proletariat Now? The definition of proletariat can be perplexing to someone unfamiliar with all the nuances involved in it. On the other side of the coin, it can seem all too easy to someone who uses the term dogmatically, refusing to make adjustments as they are deemed necessary. In truth, Marx used the term to describe people who were brutally oppressed and had nothing to lose but their chains. This hardly describes many first world people at all. Many of these people can book a day off to go protesting, while those who did so in the past were doing so because they had been squeezed out of economic life. Back in the day, a union went on strike, risking their homes, money, and even their lives. When people strike today, they have a decent living standard, even if they don't win. In the third world, those who strike risk their lives. In fact, a good many of them are killed every year. According to the International Labor Organization, there are 5,000 labor-related deaths a day. That's a day. The vast overwhelming majority of them are in the third world. An excellent description of proletariat is someone who has nothing to lose but their chains. I think that really says more to how Marx said the working class would be exploited. If they were not under such exploitative pressure, they would not be revolutionary. This is exactly what we see today with the working class in the first world who refuses to take serious, if any, revolutionary action. Many sections of this so-called working class actively sabotage and attack other sections based on merely preserving their own privilege above other workers. Some of them are even outright racist. There is no labor unity in the first world, as there is in the third world. Any attempt to claim so is rooted in denial and nostalgia for times gone past. Today, we see the new proletariat the working and poor of the third world who oftentimes have nothing. Sometimes they literally have nothing to lose but their chains. The immiseration of the third world poor is sometimes even worse than it was for working class people in Europe in the 17th century. No first world person has to walk five miles in order to get drinkable water first world people don't worry about dying of something as simple as diarrhea. The misery forced upon them by imperialism is producing some of the harshest living conditions that humanity has ever seen. Now, Jason, this is very similar to how Donna Newman describes white privilege in Western domination. Uh, This describes a large part of what we in the Buddhist movement condemn in Americanism. I was wondering if you would be willing to give some commentary on this. I think it's a fairly accurate description. I think that a lot of people are, are very quick to point out that there's poverty in the first world. Of course there is. You know, there's, there's no denying that, and we would, we would not deny that. I think the problem is 
to what degree? I'm sure that there are plenty of awful situations in the first world. Some uh, Native American reservations are are on the level of a third world country. But I think the point is, what does that translate to in terms of revolutionary potential? I think that's the key thing here. It's, It's not enough to simply say, Okay, look, there's a massive how there's a massive homeless problem in California. Sure, uh, there there's no denying that. But where what does that mean in terms of revolutionary potential? And people have a tendency to just automatically say, "Yeah, it's right there. There's the potential." But what has that ever translated to? I mean, I I keep going I keep going back to the well, but I I look at it this way. How much revolutionary potential was there during the Great Depression? I mean, there couldn't have been a better time in the history of the United States to carry out a class-based revolution than the Great Depression. Well, FDR solved that by neutralizing the people with liberal concessions. <laughs> because the advanced countries, the imperialist countries, can do that, and they can buy them off every they can buy them off every single time. Because that's a privilege that, if you, if you want to use the word privilege, uh, that you have from being in the first world, from the, the from the epicenters of global exploitation. Uh, the the yellow vests right now, they're uh, massively strike uh, striking, fighting against uh, their own government, and people have a tendency to point there. It is there's there's the revolutionary potential, but. Keep in mind, look at the Yellow Vest demands. They're not demanding revolution. They're only asking for back the same uh, social democratic benefits that were just recently taken away by that very system. This is a neoliberal order. And, and yes, there is a neoliberal order that is sweeping the first world, that is doing deregulation, that is getting rid of uh, many of the social programs that uh, first world people enjoy. But the thing is, those things can come right back. And probably will with the way that the trends are going, which will clamp down further on the third world. But I think the think what you've just stressed is that there is, in fact, exploitation in the first world, but the first world itself is not exploited. Did I, did, am I catching that correctly? If I'm wrong, you can correct me. Okay, the first world is is not exploited. That is not to say there is no exploitation in the first world. Uh, This is a very common straw man argument that's thrown against us that we claim that there's no exploitation in the first world. We do not say that. Our point is to point out where is the manufacturing. For, For Marx, what was important was who is the direct producer of value. That would be the person who manufactures, not the person who's, uh, say, works at Walmart and who has a, a, a terrible wage. They're part of facilitating the transfer of the commodity to the customer, but they are not the, prode- the direct producer of value. And normally, argument is given that, well, it, it's part of that same system. Well, that's true, but the difference is – it's not exactly the way that Marx described it. It would be a necessary, it is a necessary part of that transfer, but that divide between who is the retail worker and who is the actual worker who creates the value is no longer a question of somebody down the road or somebody in another part of the country who produces it, but someone who lives on the other side of the world who gets uh, an insanely small amount of income for being the one who directly produces while the person who merely transfers it to the customer receives an astronomically higher an astronomically higher wage while not actually contributing to the labor process. Now, of course, there's exploitation in the first world because there is manufacturing in the first world. Now, m- many of the first world uh, jobs are supplemented by value that is stolen from the third world. Uh, we can afford to pay workers more to make this product because we get our steel from an underdeveloped third world country. Uh, a, best, a good way of putting it would be looking at it as a a mall economy what is actually made at the mall 
almost nothing. Everything is just sold there. It's coming in from somewhere else. Uh, you've got uh, fast food workers. Fast food workers uh, definitely are exploited in in uh, in the real sense of the word. Their labor is what puts together what it is that people buy. However, when you look at the the larger context of the entire mall, the food court is essentially the only place where that really is the case. For the rest, it's just uh, people transferring a product from the capitalist to the to the customer, and not actually the direct producer of value. That's very good. That's very insightful too. Thank you. And next, we are going to a piece from First Worldism is Anti Science, which is part of Chapter Five: Theories of Imperialism. The very essence of First Worldism is to dogmatically hold on to the words of the heads of Marxism in opposition to an evolution in the science of revolution. They dogmatically hold on to dialectics as though it were a science when it is not. There is a reason why revolution is not happening. This is why. Science has been shoved aside for the sake of hero worship. There is nothing wrong with praising those who have achieved great things in Marxism. But when you do it at the expense of Marxism itself, that is reactionary. The worst example of this is Hojism. Albanian leader Enver Hoxha was opposed to the revolutionary contributions uh, by Mao that showed that perhaps the advanced industrialized nations were not the most revolutionary group. Marx himself had claimed this, but this is not what happened. Russia, the most backward of European countries, and China, a very feudal society, were the ones to carry out revolution. Once the Soviet Union turned revisionist, Hoxha created the most dogmatic and anti-scientific way of thinking. Essentially, his line came down to, whatever Stalin did was right, whatever Stalin said was right. As Mao became the ideological leader of revolution, in the 60s and 70s, Hoxha vehemently opposed him and other leaders. Many of those he opposed were Euro-communists, but he also opposed genuine, real revolutionaries. Mao's ideas allowed other countries that would, by Marxist-Leninist theory, not be revolutionary to engage in struggle. Struggles broke out all over Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Hoxha dis dedicated a great deal of time making straw man arguments and spreading falsehoods against any Marxist or revolution of color. The world had changed since Stalin and Lenin's time, but he absolutely refused to believe it and dogmatically held those views to a dishonest level. He did this to the point of sabotaging his own country by ruining foreign relations. We do not live in Marx's, Lenin's, or Mao's time. We live in a new one that requires a new theory. To refuse to acknowledge this is anti-science and anti-Marxist. Now this is very profound. Do you see a strong lack of anti-dogmatism in Marxist circles today, Jason? Absolutely. I think that the main problem is if you if you look at it, I, I consider there to be two levels. There's the more academic approach, and then there's the more um, mainstream approach. The mainstream approach is mainly memes and Stalin worship. That's the you know the 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 Facebook arguments, the social media uh, kind of nonsense that we're inundated with constantly. Uh, and in which case, it is mostly just memes, uh, appeals to hypocrisy, while certainly valid in in some cases. But most of it is just uh, a lot of is stolen worship. But when you look at the more uh, academic level, the more stuff like uh, Jacobin Magazine, you know, uh, the Frankfurt School, the the more higher end academics. You also see the same kind of problem as a as a refusal to step forward. 
whenever we really look at their theories, it's essentially Marxism, Leninism, and then gender theory or Marxism, Leninism, and then, uh, you know, uh, LGBTQ. Okay, that that's that's great, and, and you know the LGBTQ people are obviously uh, oppressed by the social order, but uh, that's not moving revolution forward. Like it's not updating the revolutionary theory to a point of uh, creating a new theory for revolution. It's just adding in. Okay, these this group is also oppressed. Okay, okay, yeah, I, I think we all agree on that. So where's the update? Good point. The actual the actual core struggle, that being class, it, it's not being updated. And I think that they, they, they try to portray it in a certain way. Oh, look, we're at the, the gig economy now. And, and that means workers are, are, are even more oppressed. And like, well, we're still looking at an entirely different wealth divide. You know, we're still looking at a huge gap between the first and the third world, something that they they want to pretend doesn't exist. Oh, here's the gig economy. Oh, uh, wages are, are going down. And for the most part, that's actually not even true. Uh, m- more recently, like in the last year or so, yes, they've gone down. But the overall trend in the first world has been for wages to increase. And I think the problem is that's not being taken into consideration. I think that if anybody really does sit down and honestly look at it, they end up recognizing that the first world is becoming you know, the first world is a class onto itself that lives off of the labor of the third world and frequently they don't want to hear that they don't want to hear how they're privileged in some way although go incessantly on about straight privilege incessantly go on about white privilege which which for the most part are perfectly real but when it comes down to the economics of it, they don't want to hear it. They want to pretend that today is still the same as it was during Lenin's time. They don't. They don't want to hear anything different. And even most uh, most Maoists today uh, in the first world don't even actually follow Mao's Mao's even theories on imperialism all that much. They focus primarily on themselves. They go, okay, Mao said imperialism was the is the primary contradiction, which which third worldists would absolutely agree is is still perfectly valid. But then they turn around and look at other uh, oppressions. Well, I thought you just said imperialism was the primary contradiction, but then they end up going essentially ignoring imperialism for something that is something that oppresses them rather than scientifically understanding that imperialism is the primary contradiction. So they're kind of contradicting themselves by saying this. And it's very interesting. It shows that the anti-scientific way where they're not even living up to the level it is that they claim to be much less providing something even new. If you get my No, name. no, I do. In fact, um, as far as Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, revolutionary potential is, like one of the highest places of that would be India, which is heavily way more oppressed than anything we see out here. And there is oppression and exploitation out here, as you've also stated, but not at the terrifying level of India. I mean, like, you already know about India. I know you do. So, but this, it's, no, I'm, I, I, I can't, I can't rebuttal what you just said because it's true. This is a piece from Resistance and Revolution, which is taken from Chapter 6, The Theory of Maoism Third Worldism. One of the most common objections to Third Worldism is the false belief that we advocate doing nothing. People have the perception that we believe that the path to revolution is just standing around waiting for revolution to happen elsewhere. This 
do-nothing-ism is far from what we advocate. First worldists often use this as a straw man argument against us. In our view, we see the struggle for revolution in the first world as being a waste of resources and energy that could be more productively used elsewhere. As first worldists have little to no knowledge of our theory, they simply believe that we have washed our hands of the global north and resigned ourselves to inactivity. This is quite far from the truth. We advocate no such thing. While the first world is devoid of any significant revolutionary potential, that does not mean it is devoid of revolutionary people. There are always some anomalies who, despite their global class position, still have a revolutionary spirit. These people must come forward and leave all the pretenders and fakes behind. They must charge ahead and leave all those phonies to their wallow self-aggrandization. The real revolutionaries must reject the dogmatism that plagues Marxism and fight for real change. We must rise above college activist groups, cosplaying revolution with childish antics and internet drama. We must leave behind the dustbin of history, the ivory tower academic elitists who tout themselves as great theorists while they down real revolution in dogmatism fueled by self-importance. The real revolutionaries must stand up, sweep aside ego, and set upon doing real work that creates liberation. Those small few who have real revolutionary potential must work in the most reactionary realm as a forward light. This is very interesting, Jason. Can you give some further flushed out meaning to all of this, if you will, if that's all right? Right. Well, I, I think that we can all pretty much agree that calling people names on the internet isn't revolution. No, it's not. <laughs> I think we can all pretty much accept that uh, responding to Donald Trump on social media isn't revolution. And constantly yelling back and forth at each other on social media doesn't mean anything. Uh, much of the the Maoists in the first world have a tendency to march around in public in guerrilla type uniforms, uh, sometimes waving guns, but they don't accomplish anything. I mean, sure, it's great to get seen, but what's actually being accomplished by this? And that's that's on the lower level. On the on the more academic level, it's 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 it's, it's people trying to come up with a, a, as much of a complicated theory as possible in order to look like this this great theorist. Uh, uh, the a postmodernist crowd is particularly bad for this. They create these entire word salads to make this very long, convoluted essays with something that could have probably been said in three paragraphs. And this this is a problem with the academia in general. The need to be seen as some great intellect rather than just making the damn idea accessible to people to begin with, which is why I don't bother with any of that nonsense. You know, you, you, you speak plainly to people with using as little convoluted language as possible, most ideas can be expressed quite easily and quite it, quite quickly when you're not deliberately peppering in, you know, complicated terminology for the sake of boosting their own ego. And that's uh, largely what uh, people are doing, at, at least on on the academic level. Uh, many of them feel themselves superior to to other people because they have a college degree or a university degree in something and essentially they're talking down to anybody who isn't on their their educational uh, level this is like the kind of you know the, the ivory tower liberal thing that we see that that many marxists end up doing themselves
Indeed, they don't even seem to try to figure out a mass line for the very communities they claim to be liberating. Uh, they do a lot of co-opting and entryism, too. I mean, I see this with some of those very college students you're talking about. They're just as bad, if not worse, here in the United States than they are in Canada. <laughs> the next one is a piece from American Exceptionalism, which is a part of Chapter 7, First Worldist Consciousness. One of the most insidious aspects of American society is the social mentality, American exceptionalism. Essentially, the idea is that there is some kind of virtue to the American people that places them above others in the world. They perceive themselves as somehow better or superior to others. Americans are raised to believe that they have some inherent quality about them that justifies no less demands that they be a major force in the world. This same mentality is what has justified all of the horrors of the system as well. They are not only forgiven for committing these crimes, they are glorified and often duty bound to commit them. Often it is directly linked to the concept of manifest destiny by Andrew Jackson style Democrats. So, the style of hardcore anti-Americanism in this book is refreshing. I'd like to say that. Do you also find that American exceptionalism is interwoven with the toxicity of American ultranationalism in relation to imperialism? I would definitely say so. I would say that there's a, a very big difference between nationalism of the oppressed countries and the nationalism of the oppressor countries now unfortunately you know i i'm not i'm not saying anything that that's new here what's what's sad is that it's actually been forgotten when you when you uh, glorify national pride in the oppressor countries you're are uh, you're you're forwarding oppression when you're uh pushing nationalism in the oppressed countries you're pushing freedom from foreign domination and these are two very different things and I, I think that a few people uh, understand that one of the problems that we saw is the, uh, the the situation in Syria where uh, a lot of the first world Maoists said oh we're not going to we're not going to side with uh, Assad and, and we're not going to side with the United States uh, both sides are, are bad and well, then don't really have anything actually to say beyond that. When well, you're supposed to be understanding the pri that imperialism is the primary contradiction here. I mean, if you're Maoist, that's that's kind of the point. You don't have to like Assad. You just have to support his country not being bombed into the ground and having hundreds of thousands of people killed in a war. Apparently, that's a concept that's too hard for them to understand. The thing is that they they perceive themselves as superior in in some way. Like they here's another way of putting it: they're constantly putting down a lot of revolutions for being too violent. Oh well, this one. Uh, does this and it doesn't have you know our line on this particular issue therefore they don't know what they're talking about uh, for example uh, a third world a country where people you know don't even have enough clean water to drink and they go well, well what's their idea what's their what's their line on gender and many of them but it, it don't have one it it really doesn't matter much to them when you know, you don't have anything to eat. I mean, it's you know, it's hard for them to understand that maybe these more highfalutin ideas don't really mean much to someone who's starving. You know, a person who's hungry, you know, they don't want a book on philosophy. They need food. I think the problem is that they don't really understand the actual divide between the first and the third world there's a real immediate material class need that has to be addressed first before they could start going into more abstract things like you know what i mean you can't build equality in a system of inequality 
you can't pound the, the, the gavel and demand the equality between groups in a system that's not only not designed to do so, but it, 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 just, it just can't happen. You're not going to get equality between any groups inside of capitalism. And I think they don't understand that, and they don't understand why third world countries, or particularly third world revolutions, would focus more on class. Because there's much more of a class need to struggle in those countries than there is the first world. There's a reason why a lot of the the uh, so-called first world revolutionaries focus on these things that aren't that aren't so much related to class, but something that would happen as a result of it is because their immediate needs are taken care of. They do have a place to live. They do have an income. Uh, many of them have uh, welfare programs, so that kind of immediate need is satisfied. I mean, let me put it another way. Sure. After the revolution in China, the the, the government mass produced winter coats. In particular for people in the northeast of China where it's very cold. They mass produced blue and green coats. Or, or blue and gray. I forget the exact colors. And people in the in the first world were like, Oh god, look at them. All blue and gray. They all look like little blue and gray ants, and it's oh it's so much easier to control people when they all look the same kind of mentality. When this was divorced from the actual material conditions, people didn't have coats. And frequently, coming out of the semi-feudal era, people only owned one outfit. That's all they had. The point was to produce as many coats as quickly as possible to provide for that need for warm clothing. Putting stuff, putting the fabrics through a whole bunch of dye processes, coming up with a whole bunch of colorful, different style of fabrics, you know, that was not a priority. Get the immediate need done, and then you can work on. Then you can work on, you know, uh, making those kinds of improvements. For example, once that was done, the first thing they did was uh, create better clothing for children, things with bright, beautiful colors. Uh, things with uh, a, a very vibrant, uh, very vibrant looks to them, but they gave them to the children first because they were they were the future. But uh, you can't criticize them for trying to fill the immediate need first, and then once that's been taken care of, then they can move on to creating different kinds of clothes that you can buy. For, you know, th that kind of con consumer, you know, kind of fetishism where I have to have as much variety as possible or else, you know, uh, you know, basically the, the rightest argument if I don't have a bunch of market choice and I don't have any. I mean, what was what was the condition of China? You didn't have any choice. There was no coat at all for you to get. And so they, they came in immediately and produced as many coats as quickly as possible. And because that immediate need is already satisfied in the first world, they're able to think about all these other things, these uh, secondary oppressions. And yes, yes, they are secondary uh, com com compared, compared to class. They are able to focus on these things because the immediate one is already taken care of. All right, then, yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I don't think that uh, I don't think that people are thinking about a lot of these things personally uh, when I when I look at it, especially because I have talked to people in the more third world conditions, and they kind of look at you funny when you bring up what people consider real issues out here. And then there's like a lot of bigotry I've noticed. Like, I, I knew one person that, for instance, said, "I don't want to support Hamas because they're homophobic." And my reply was like, well, you don't know that exactly for sure, except that I suppose maybe that's true given, you know, some things I've heard. But the fact is, is Gaza is the biggest open air prison in the world, man. I mean, that's your concern is, you know, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's they're more concerned about being alive. You know, in fact, not to mention the people voted for Hamas because they knew Hamas would 
take a more hardline stance against the apartheid, the so-called State of Israel. The next one is social alienation. I will now read a piece from Social Alienation, which is a part of Chapter 8, Identity Politics, The Death of Marxism. The most inhumane aspect of capitalism is its ability to alienate people from each other. When social relations are replaced by commodity relations, we dehumanize each other. At one point in history, we all lived in harmony with each other and with nature. But something came along and changed all of that. That thing that changed was the invention of private property. In each prevailing mode of production, there are definite, concrete, social relations that are formed. The relations of production are the dominating effect on our social relations. Again, we return to the idea of the base and superstructure. For Marxists, it is the act of labor, the production of society's goods, which determines our social relations, meaning we understand ourselves in relation to others and the world around us. Now, I have brought this part of your book up because after talking to you in private I've realized that even though we're even though that what we are doing in the Buddhist movement could be seen as identity politics what we stand for is not something that you have condemned I've noticed uh, talk about Marxist theory talk about social alienation and how it relates to what you and I would presume others categorize as identity politics. Obviously not the way we're referring to it, because we're referring to it in the, the global class struggle, particularly against neocolonialism that the Panthers stood for. When you're talking about identity politics, I notice you're using a completely different context than what we mean by it. Like, social alienation, I'd like to hear what, you know, I mean, I, and I think this in a way would relate to the previous part of the chapter that was brought up, because... Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm sensing a stream of, 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 of where this theory, you know, and how you project this theory as it is. I'd like to hear about social alienation, your words, your particular words. Well, in, in capitalism, relations between people are replaced between, are replaced with relations between things. Uh, you know, this is, I mean, I mean I'm, not, I'm not giving anything new here. I mean, this is just, this is Marxism 101. Uh, you know, instead of seeing this as a person that you give something to, you know, this is someone that you're selling something to. It becomes a transaction. It becomes commodified. The person that you receive the product from isn't a person. It's the guy behind the counter at a store. It's, it's an economic transaction. It's now, like, you, 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 you you know what yeah, I mean, right? Yeah, of course right? I know. Of course I know. It's of not a, I know. And this creates that divide between people. And I think that in our modern capitalist society, that alienation has grown and grown and grown. The more commodified society is, the greater that alienation is as well. And that happens a lack of you know, like an economic need of each other. You see, like in third world countries, people will live for many generations in the same house because they have to. Because that that's how you survive. Whereas in ours, it, that's not even considered... Uh, that's considered bad. You have to, you have to uh, move. You have to uh, break away from family your own like kind of individualism is is really really important people become disconnected from each other and then end up creating identities to replace that that connection they once had with people uh subcultures are basically a product of that uh, now, s some subcultures can be uh, can sometimes even be outright revolutionary, and many can be outright reactionary. Whereas most of them fall, you know, somewhere 
in, in the idea of giving a new form of connection for people. Uh, fandoms for particular television shows have replaced connections between people. So that because they are alienated from each other, they find a common ground in something that they like. And that becomes their new identity. I'm a, I'm a big whatever fan. Uh, a lot of the fetishism that, that comes out of pornography and uh, pornified culture in general is uh, essentially the same thing. Relations between men and women have been so poisoned by a history of class and by alienation that they end up creating these fetishes in order to facilitate that connection once again. Well, I'm going to look for someone that has the same fetish as me. Well, why aren't you looking for someone who has the same kind of interest you have, the same kind of life goals as someone that you connect with on an emotional level? Because those things are essentially gone because of alienation. And then they end up being supplemented by things like uh, fetish clubs, uh, things like, well, I, I chase after this particular type of, of woman because that's my fetish and she chases after men like me because that's her particular fetish. I mean, that's not the, that's not a healthy basis for a relationship. I think everybody can pretty much agree on that. When you, uh, take a look at more, the, the more advanced, a capitalist society you have the more alienation you have look at uh japan uh they have a very advanced uh capitalist uh culture and they suffer from the some of the the worst uh aspects of alienation the uh hikikomori i think it is uh the the people who people in their 20s or even early 30s who have completely cut themselves off from the rest of the world like they'll they'll live in their bedroom for like months at a time and never go outside they'll just play video games or read uh, or watch anime or whatever and have no connection i mean if that's not alienation that's probably the, the best example of alienation there could possibly be they're literally avoiding contact with other human beings and i think that with that being there, people resort to these other identities in order to cope with themselves, in order to cope with their position within society. And the reason they can do so is because their immediate needs, their immediate material needs are taken care of. They don't have to struggle to get food the way a, a third world person would have to these identities and these I, I this identity politics and then building a whole system of politics around these identities is something that s someone can do because their immediate material needs are taken care of yeah i'm sure their job sucks uh, their apartment's not in a very good neighborhood but they do have the job. They do have the apartment, and they're able to spend money on their uh, uh, hobbies that arise out of alienation because that material need is already taken care of. It's one of the things of um, it's one of the things of capitalism in general, and one of the contradictions that the more developed a society is, the more alienated it becomes, just because of those material conditions. I hope I'm being clear about no, that. No, no, you've made yourself very clear, and um, you've, you've brought up some very, very good points. Uh, we're going to go to part two now, though, um, so stay with us, everybody. All right, so Jason, uh, we have a series of questions that we would like to present to Marxist Leninist, Marxist Leninist, Maoist, and Maoist Third Worldists. We'd like to know can Marxist Leninists, Marxist Leninist Maoists, and Maoist Third Worldists recognize the Jewish people as a national minority? Well, I can't speak for all of the groups. Uh, I, I, I can say for myself that uh, I, I don't particularly have a problem with it. I don't, I don't see why it would be an issue. Fair enough. Are the Jewish people 
considered to be subject to racism in the form of anti-Semitism? Well, I mean, it's pretty hard to deny that anti-Semitism exists. I mean, that's that's fairly obvious from anybody who's spent even 30 seconds on the Internet. You know, that's that's pretty obvious. So, uh, yeah, I would say, sure, of, of course, there's a such thing as anti-Semitism. All right. Is there a possible alliance of the Jewish people in a united front of oppressed nationalities apart from an alliance with some Jewish people? Well, I definitely, definitely, we can all work together as long as we're I've got one, you know, one, you know, particular goal in mind. As long as we're working towards the same ends, I don't see any, any reason why we can't work together. It's uh, it makes it makes perfect sense to me. I mean, communism really is one of those things where, uh, to borrow a phrase from a person whose name I, escapes me right now, uh, we're we're either all going to get there, or frankly, none of us are. Right on. Are national oppression and class oppression related, and how? Well, I would definitely say so that, that they are they are definitely oppressed. Uh, I'm definitely of the opinion that most racism actually stems from the economic system itself. Generally, people like to believe that imperialism is a product of racism, uh, whereas I would say no. Racism is a product of imperialism of the class uh, and, and other – uh, class oppressions. Uh, basically, uh, largely racism didn't exist in most of the far, far back history. Uh, a lot of uh, race-based slavery came about as of a need to identify who is a slave, and they would p pick particular uh, groups. That's just to uh, just just to say it really quick, not to really drag everything out. Um, most of the the racism that we see across the world is uh, out of a d desire to f form a particular uh, worldview. Uh, the, the racism then ends up justifying it. Uh, for example, uh, Palestinians being seen as particularly inferior to Zionists is a is essentially a product of the justification for Zionism itself. Uh, you uh, get what I'm trying to say? Oh yeah, yeah. In fact, um, this is uh, this this correlates perfectly with what Fred Hampton said about racism being a byproduct of capitalism, and imperialism is is a much higher stage of capitalism too. So it makes perfect sense. Uh, the next question would be, how is Zionism to be considered in class and revolutionary terms? Well, I mean, Zionism is straight up reactionary. I mean, there, there's absolutely no doubt about that whatsoever. I mean, anything that deliberately promotes racism cannot be considered revolutionary in any way, shape, or form. Anything that builds an apartheid state cannot be considered revolutionary in any in any shape or form. I think that much is uh, fairly obvious, and um, Zionism can't lead to the end of all oppressions and I think that's the main point that people need to understand if we're going to get to an egalitarian world an ideology which believes that one group of people are inherently superior to another can certainly not be considered the ally of egalitarianism indeed and I suppose in a way this uh, answers uh, number six is Zionism racism <laughs> Which was the yeah. next one. Yeah, yeah. All right. Is the state of Israel Jewish or Zionist? Oh, it's obviously Zionist. Uh, you know what? I don't even think they even deny it at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, they, they beat up the rabbis relentlessly, and they, yeah. It's, <laughs> um, furthermore, you know, we have no problem with the Palestinians. They have a problem with the Palestinians. Is a united front a predecessor to a constitutional assembly? To be perfectly honest, I don't think I know enough to really answer that question. That's fair enough. What is the purpose of a party formation and 
is it more important than a united front? Well, that's a very interesting question. I think that there are two things that, uh, that, that need to go hand in hand. I don't think that they're, hmm. It's like saying what's more important on a car, the, uh, the steering or the wheels. You don't really have a car either way. I think that they're both very key elements where you could say one is more difficult to build than the other or one might be more prone to breaking than the other. But, I mean, in the end, you actually really do need both of them. So it's kind of a hard question to answer, if you know what I mean. That's fine. That's fine. Um, giving the light of it um, from the way that this is written, um, I think that – You've answered our questions to the best of your ability, and I, I find them satisfactory. Um, I'm sure Donna will. Um, I think Dr. Abram Weisfeld will appreciate you answering these questions. And we will now go to part three. We are, we are here on the conclusion to this presentation. And the subject is from Mao Zedong's combat liberalism. Jason Andrew, combat liberalism. What's this about? I think that uh, it's probably one of the most important works that we can that we can possibly read today because there is a massive liberalism problem. Uh, I would say that social media in general is pure liberalism. I can't think. Other than when social media is used to organize rallies and protests, outside of that, social media is incredibly toxic. The There is so much name-calling, insults, and one-liners in social media that what good is any of that? What does any of that accomplish? Does that forward ideas in any way, shape, or form? I mean, we could even look into this in uh, the form of call-out culture. Exactly what is actually achieved by any of this? Nothing. You would get, you know, ten times more out of a blog post than you would out of out of a post on Tumblr or Twitter or even Facebook. And I'm going to say something that's unpopular. To be perfectly honest, I hate memes. I think memes are one of the most degenerate forms of communication possible, and I don't think I, I don't think Marxists should engage in them at all. Memes have never made a point. They have never adequately expressed an idea, and basically. They're mostly just insults, and there's nothing accomplished from that. There is no debate with memes. There's just yelling back and forth at best. This is liberalism, as in it, it doesn't forward an understanding of anything. If anything, it's just petty drama, and that's one of the, the, the biggest goddamn problems – that 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 we have. I'm trying to look up the 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 exact the exact quote. To indulge in personal attacks, pit quarrels, invite personal spite, or seek revenge instead of entering into argument and struggle with incorrect views for the sake of progress or unity to get work done properly. This is a fifth type. This is the vast majority of first worldism. And I don't think any honest person can honestly say that it isn't. This is literally social media in general. Any and this is this is memes in general. I disagree with your position because X. Oh my God, you're Y problematic. This this isn't this isn't discussing ideas. This isn't struggling over who's got the correct line, and that's literally what that's literally what people do. 
they they don't discuss ideas at all. They just yell something at something X phobic or something X reactionary at something at a statement that they disagree with. There's no actual like real work done on what to figure out what is the correct line. And I know everybody has seen that. There is no way you could be a Marxist and have a connection to the internet and not see this. Well, Boone just see it too. Uh, ridiculous. Uh, uh, often there are memes, not, not even from Marxists, but memes just from like fascists or pseudo-fascists saying Stalin killed more people than Hitler, although I know for a fact that that's just not freaking true. Um, that they're often, it's almost like a, I don't know, it's like pissing contests. I, I, I understand what you're saying about memes. Uh, the sixth type, to hear incorrect views without rebuttaling them, and even to hear counter-revolutionary remarks, remarks without reporting them, but instead to take them calmly as if nothing happened. Your thoughts? Number six happens... Because number five is so prevalent. Mm -hmm. If I say, no, this, like, I can't tell you how many times I've said, I know this line is wrong because as a explanation or 10 minute video explaining in detail why it's wrong to have people respond with, oh my God, you're X or oh my God, you're Y. No, I'm putting forward an explanation. If my explanation or the theoretical thing I'm laying down is incorrect, then please show me how it is wrong. But they don't. And that's not – it's not limited to me. Other That happens to a lot of other people as well where they'll put forth a solid argument, but what's presented is – in return to it is personal attacks, quarrels, verse, uh, personal spite, and and revenge. And if you have a toxic culture or a toxic Marxist culture, it, it's not limited to Marxists, but I, I, I am singling Marxists out for this because we're supposed to be better than that. When everything is just responded to with personal attack – quarrels and personal spite it's like how do you reason with someone who's being unreasonable you know what I mean like if you could present a, a tremendous argument and there's nothing given in response but insults how long is it before you give up giving arguments and just throw insults back you know, in my experience uh, with a lot of these things, uh, when it, especially when it revolves around theory, sometimes uh, you can't even explain, no, I don't completely disagree with your theory. Like, like for instance, we make mention to you that, for instance, we would not completely agree with the conclusions, but we agree with the diagnosis. And sometimes that's often what happens. People don't disagree as much as they seem to act like they do. In fact, they're more united than divided. And yet the, the, the sectarianism uh, just continues. Um, I think the anarchists are just as bad as the Marxists on this, you know, because I, if not I worse, if, if, well, yeah, well, yeah, if not worse, I mean, uh, I, I could, I could pick and choose my favorites. It's no secret that I'm very suspicious of the mutualists after the way they've consistently treated us. And then other anarchists, when other anarchists tend to be more correct than the mutualists, but that's, I will admit a biased opinion, but the, the name calling, the, uh, the the death threats, I've seen that too, death threats consistently between, uh, for instance, uh, anarcho-communists and mutualists will make death, threat at, death threats at each other on Facebook, which, the last I checked, that is not really part of the terms of services of Facebook, which whatever, Facebook is a bourgeois outlet, however... That's really sad when I thought you guys – like the big question should be shouldn't you guys be railing against capitalism and the state? Isn't that your big thing, capitalism and the state? But no, you're making death threats over theory. You know, you know, it's uh, the quarreling. And there are memes too. Talk about memes on both of those sides. Let's bring back the political cartoon. You know the old political cartoons you used to see in newspapers? 
Yeah, but I mean, in the in in the first world, those are always anti-communist. Yeah, they don't have to be, but I kind of I I, I, I kind of I kind of miss the old you know political cartoons that have been supplanted by memes. <laughs> you know what, man? There's a project that's up in the air that I wanted to do with Marxists. It's called the Brown Scare. Did you ever hear that that thing that goes um. Uh, if a, if a, if a person does dissension against the you know the United States of America, he might be a communist. I'm thinking about he might be a fascist. I'm thinking of starting a brown scare. You know, <laughs> I think it would be useful. A brown scare. I mean, look, you know, you're Maoist third worldist. I'm a Bundist. You know, there's other Bundists here. You have made clear you're not the only Maoist third worldist. We're both socialists. We both believe in world revolution. We both believe in class struggle. Let's start a brown scare. Let's do something productive with these cartoons. I, I think political cartoons would be great. You know, let, let, let's show people why Nazism is bad, why why Franco and Mussolini were bad people. You know, because you know it's it goes largely. Uh, I mean, it, it goes largely accepted. You know, I mean, I remember Trump's like the alt right and the alt left. There are problems on both sides, and in a, in, in essence, he legitimized fascism in that sense when when he did that especially because there is no alt left no one calls themselves the alt left you know um unironically well you know um i suppose you could say there's a maybe there's an alt left because alt refers to alternative uh but whatever i mean that i think a brown scare would be necessary because you know is there really a communist conspiracy no but there is an operation paperclip there is the part where the Nazis were in cahoots with the Zionists. There should be an actual brown scare. People should, like, especially if they claim to be such patriotic citizens, uh, you know, and I don't, I don't think patriotism as we define it, which would be love for your homeland, exists in the first world at all, to be honest with you. Particularly it does, but particularly it does, it couldn't possibly in Canada, America, New Zealand, and Australia, because those are nothing but colonial projects. So there can't be any patriotism over there, and any and, and any other any other claim to country would just be ultra nationalism. Um, but you want to bring back the political cartoons, really? I, I think that that's a good idea. We like I, I just told you, I just showed you my cards there. You know what me and some of my uh, friends and comrades have thought about doing a, a brown scare. Brown scare cartoons might be effective too, at least as satirical realism in some sense. What do you think about that? That could be, uh, that could be, uh, I think that could definitely be helpful. I think it's, it's important to get away from the incredibly toxic culture of memes. Well, you know, we use a lot of social media, but a lot of times we get complaints because we're not always on there, but that's because we're trying to do on ground work. Dr. Weisfeld is literally putting his life online by taking a camera into the West Bank. He's back in the West Bank right now. And, you know, it's so weird, the out-of-touch thing that where I have to explain to people, no, the Palestinians don't hate him. In fact, Dr. Weisfeld's practically a celebrity over there because they love him so much. And, uh, you know, I saw a uh, – Dunya is a French journalist uh, who was in the West Bank. I don't know if she's there right now. But she uh, was filming, and these Palestinians knew that they were being filmed by – being filmed in a way where they'd be seen by – people who could speak English, and this one Palestinian comes up, and I think the problem with this Palestinian is, not, not a problem with the Palestinian himself, but what he was saying is, is I think he was conflating, not because he was conflating Zionism with Judaism or Jude, Jewishness, but he was thinking as if he was talking to a Jewish person, he says, we've lived with you for for hundreds of hundreds of years, as if he was talking to somebody Jewish, because if, if you were talking to a Jewish mind, that you'd get a good response, but he wasn't getting that response, he was just getting a Zionist who continued, and he's like, I think he said, why are you bulldozing my mother's house? But what this reflects is the Palestinians, to this day, they have no problem with Jewish people. You know, and how many people even know that? You know, you, you know, there are a lot of people that do know that now, but not at the level where it's effective enough to push back against it. I mean, BDS has been good pushback, but it can always be taken away. And it reminds me of what Stokely Carmichael said about boycotts being a, a passive act. You know, and I don't advocate for violence. I know that Dr. Weisfeld doesn't. I know Donna Newman doesn't. I know that our, our council members don't. But we do advocate for self-defense, and I think that, you know, it's great that the BD, the anti-BDS bill was thrown out. You did an excellent report on that, by the way. But 
for how long will it be thrown out until they come up with some really creative excuse? Because, you know, there was uh, there was SOPA that didn't pass, but then there was CISPA that I don't remember where it was passed and was halted or if it eventually passed anyway, but that came through. Then net neutrality was taken away. And so all of these nonviolent forms of measure and social media, they have their limitations because they're not, you know, you can't, you've said this, and this is classic, I don't mean classical Marxist, I mean, well, this is ideally Marxist. The old society must be overthrown by the new. You know, and, and uh, I think one of the things we've come to realize is whether we call it um, coexistence, cooperation, or communism, it's never, neither of those are going to ever be achieved without world socialist victory. And world socialist victory can't be achieved by sitting on your butt. At least, for instance, you, I, I take it, if I, and you can correct me on this, I take it your form of resistance is through journalism. I take it. Yeah, well, if I were to pick up a gun and start shooting people in the first world, I think we know what would happen. Yeah, obviously. I think that the most important thing is anti-war, anti-war, anti-war. And you don't even necessarily have to use violence to do that. What do you think about eco-socialism? It's becoming a large and larger concern with us as the environment just continues to go down. And, and, and you know, you'd be amazed how much I'm finding that the Heritage Foundation has a lot to do with really accepted propaganda that there is no climate change problem. You know, and I and, I, and whenever I see the word... Whenever I see something traced back to the Heritage Foundation, it's almost like I have to discount it as completely false. But, I mean, what do you, what do you think about eco-socialism? Uh, I mean, I, obviously, you're pro-socialism. I mean, if that's maybe how they want to get people to go to socialism, okay, that that's fine. I don't think that we oppose that. I mean, getting people to understand climate change and that capitalism can't solve the, the 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 climate change problem. I mean, that's pretty obvious by now. No, I, I understand that, but the the environment, what's happening, is really terrifying. You know, it it, it is. Uh, I mean, and it's done for profit. The deforestation of you know um, things is really starting. We're already seeing the effect. You know about the big crack in the uh, in the. Uh, in the, um, the 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 ice caps, right? They found the biggest crack over there that has ever been seen. What will happen if that cracks and the effects it will have? You know, it's a scary, it's a scary notion what the effects will be. Um, and not everything is about climate change, obviously, but I do think that that is something we have to concern ourselves with. I mean, are you concerned with the environment? Of course. I agree with the anti-war thing, though. Well, I'm I'm with you there too because uh, I mean I don't think the United States has a right to a military honestly. That's people hate it when I say that. I I always make the joke. Uh, yeah, we should uh, take guns away, take them away from the police and the military first. <laughs> well, that's uh, in the United States. That's the whole point of the Second Amendment is your right to shoot a police officer for being a hostile person and you know and it, it, it's becoming terrifying to say that openly because people look at you weird because now blue lives matter apparently even though they're not even workers they're state agents they're bourgeois state agents with thuggery mentality you know um i appreciate you talking to us do you have any last um thoughts to give on combat liberalism uh no just do it that <laughs> that's the main problem do you think that as long as one is socialist and sincere and, revol and, and has a revolutionary goal in mind do you think that this only applies to communists or to socialists in general who are serious I think it's, it's socialists in general well, that's cool I always thought that Mao Zedong was rather sincere when he wrote stuff like this and you know it's they say that there's there's 11 types that they bring out here, but they say that they could get through more. Do you think that it's come to the point where we're going to have to identify liberalism to an even higher degree? Because you talk about uh, a higher stage of Marxist theory. Uh, very possibly. Very, very possibly. 
I, I wonder if that will ever be the case where we have Jason Unner's take on combat liberalism, you know? Um, maybe you need to talk to, to, to some other, you know, authors about that if you don't feel like you could do it yourself. But I, I'd, I'd still look at it if you wrote it. Thank you for coming on here. I really appreciate it. Um, we hope to have you on again eventually soon. Okay, thank you. It was enjoyable. All right, then. All power to the people. <laughs>